So the, the good thing about having two, two lectures in a row is that I don't, I don't have to re, uh, make a summary of the previous one. <laughs> it will save me five minutes. Uh, okay, so that, that was just uh, kinematics. That was not so interesting. But now I'm going to use these this, uh, notations with the rapidities and uh, like on variables to, to discuss the kinematics and then the dynamics of a real process. I will start with PA collisions. I will alternate between PA and DIS, for me, the same kind of problem. It's the glute dense scattering and whatever is more convenient for the purpose. So, so what does it mean, particle production in PA collisions? One is not really producing particles, one is releasing them, one is freeing particles. So, uh, assume that one is looking, sorry, not so I'm looking at the, uh, so that's this proton nucleus collision, and I'm looking at the, at the production of particles of hadrons along the, along the collision axis in the fragmentation region of the proton. See? Look at here, after the scattering, looking at particle production very close to the collision axis, very small angles. Then what, what could be the mechanism for particle production in that case? A particle going that way can only come from the proton because the, the partons in the nucleus are going left moving. So the only way to have a particle at the end with a given p perp in the final state is that one of the particles in the proton, say a quark, has crossed the nucleus, has scatter of the gluon distribution inside the nucleus, which has a non-trivial non, non intrinsic transverse momentum, the saturation scale QS of the nucleus, and by, by uh, rescattering of the gluons, that quark has acquired some transverse momentum p perp of the order of QS, so it, it emerges in the final state with a p perp of order QS. You see, we start with a proton, Described by coiner factorization, all the partons in the, in the proton, all the valence quarks and all the partons, have only longitudinal momenta. They have no transverse momenta. Because the proton is a Dirich system, and Dirich systems have no intrinsic transverse momenta. The nucleus, on the other hand, is supposed to have saturation. We have a dense gluon distribution. And this, this dense system has an intrinsic scale, saturation scale. And the, the quark from the proton scatters of this gluon distribution. It acquires a momentum of the order of the transverse momentum of the gluons from here because it comes from the scattering, and then it emerges in final state. So the particle production in this case, the quark production, is the, uh, the, the fact that the quark from the proton acquires a transverse momentum via rescattering of the gluon distribution inside the nucleus. So we like to compute that rescattering. So in the first approximation, one can Im imagine that the process is a, is a two to one process, a quark from the proton with logical momentum fraction xp, the proton has a logical momentum Q plus, it's a right mover, and the, and the quark with logical momentum XP, fraction XP, scatters of a nucleon inside the nucleus. Scattered means it, it, it exchanges the gluon. So this gluon is, a, is, is exchanged by this quark and say a quark inside the nucleon. So this is the nucleus, big. This is one, it's just a nucleon, like a proton or a neutron, and that's a gluon exchanged by one of the quarks inside the nucleon and the external quark from the proton. And by the fusion between this quark and the gluon, one produces a quark in the final state, which has a non-zero p perp. Since the original quark had, was collinear with the incoming proton, this p perp comes fully from the gluon inside the, the, the nucleus, right? So here I have zero p perp, and here I have p perp, so here I have p perp. So that's the kinematics. The incoming quark has a four momentum q mu, I didn't write it here, but that's small q mu, which is a longitudinal momentum fraction xp out of the capital q mu of the proton. And this capital q mu has only a plus component, q plus. So the incoming quark has only a plus component, which is xp times q plus. It's fraction p from the proton, a fraction p out of the proton times q plus. Zero longitudinal momentum, zero like on energy, zero transverse momentum. That's in like connotations. Uh, the nucleon has a longitudinal momentum p minus. The gluon carry a fraction capital XG, G for the gluon, capital X just to distinguish what comes from the nucleus, what comes from the proton. So capital XG times p minus. And the gluon has also capital uh, uh, transverse momentum p perp because of the saturation inside the, inside the nuclear wave function. And the, the outgoing quark, produced quark, has a four momentum p mu, which is just the sum of q mu from here and, and k mu from there. So it has the same plus component as the quark from the proton, has the same minus component as the gluon from the nucleus, and has the same transverse momentum as the gluon from the nucleus. That's all. And it's in, it is customary to study this, uh, this process this quark gluon fusion into a quark in the center of mass frame of the proton nucleon pair. So, proton and the nucleon pair. The energy 
which is uh, shown in, in, in heavy ion collision or in proton nucleus collision is the energy per interacting nucleon nucleon pair. So the, this S here is not the energy of the whole nucleus, but the energy of a, nu of a single nucleon inside the nucleus, because that's the relevant energy. This proton scatters of one nucleon, not of the whole nucleus. Any of the protons here, but only one. So I'm looking now in the center of mass frame of the proton nucleon pair. So the energy in the central mass is Q plus P squared, which is two, two plus P minus, because this uh, has only plus component, it has only minus component. And since I'm in the center of mass, Q plus and P minus are equal to each other, and they're equal to square root of F divided by two by constant. And in this central mass frame, I measure the, di the kinematics of the produced quark in terms of his transverse momentum P perp and his rapidity eta. So the, pro the production angle is theta, and given the production angle with respect to cohesion axis, I can define the rapi pseudo rapidity in the standard way. So the final quark has a given p perp and a given eta, and knowing p perp and eta, I can reconstruct his plus and minus component according to the rule I shown to you before. So that's the kinematics of final quark. It has a p perp, a eta, and hence a p plus and p minus. It's on shell. Now, knowing the p plus and the p minus of the final quark, I can deduce right away the energy fraction xp and capital xg of the participating partons small xp is a p plus of the produced quark divided by the q plus of the incoming proton and if i just use uh, q plus from here and p plus from there that's the ratio is p per divided by square root of s to e to exponential exponential of, of plus eta similarly the capital xg of the gluon from the nucleus is small p minus for the produced quark divided by capital p minus of the nucleon i use small p minus from here is minus eta capital p minus from there is the mass q plus and the ratio is the same people divided by square root of s, but now e to minus eta. And now, well, this whole setup is only valid if you're looking at, at particle production at four rapidities, which means at small theta here, or large eta, positive and large. If theta is small, eta is positive and large. So uh, we're in the regime where exponential minus eta is much more than exponential plus eta. This is bigger than one, this is much more than one. So if you just look at this formula, you realize that capital XG is much more than small xp. So which means that this, Particular process which produce particle production at four rapidity is exploring the small x part of the wave function of a nucleon inside the nucleus and the large small xp part of the wave function of the, of the proton. So typically, this quark here is a valence quark because it has an xp which is relatively large, where this gluon here is a small x gluon. So, as I said before, we're using a dilute probe, in this case, a valence quark from the proton, to explore the small x distribution of the gluons inside the nucleus. That's just the kinematics. For our particle production, prop gluon evolution towards small x in the target. Please. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, I mean, sort of a dumb question, probably. Um, so, I mean, if there's really a lot of gluons at small x, right? Yes. Then so, I, so should scare, is, I should probably scatter of more than one. What do? That's my next slide, yes. Hmm? That's my next slide. Oh, okay. So uh, I, 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 may, I, I discussed formally about a two to one process. In reality, I said uh, uh, n to one. So a, a quark can scatter multiply of n with n gluon associations with one. And that's what I'm going to do in, in a moment. But the, for the kinematic uh, purpose, it's good enough to take two to one because in, in general, what I call the capital XG is a sum or a capital of the small individual XG is coming from all these gluons. Okay? So the kinematics, is, is, that was the question. Perfect. Good. So now I move to, to what, uh, what Soren just mentioned. So in reality, in reality, here I have multiple scattering because I have a dense gluon system and this quark undergoes multiple scattering. See, I show three, three, three gluon exchange. So these are different nucleons inside the nucleus and each of these nucleons scatters with my quark and by gluon exchange can be arbitrary many and together they give this final momentum here. And I would like to be able to compute multiple scattering to all orders. And the question is how can I do that? Well, in principle, the, 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 the full QCD formalis includes that beforehand. The S matrix operator for a quark scattering in a, in a, in a, in a field of the gluons, it's, uh, it's formally given by this operator to all order interactions. So this is a time order product. This is S matrix, a quantum mechanical S matrix in, in field theory, in the interaction representation. This is a time order product of the interaction Lagrangian. And the interaction Lagrangian for, a, for, a, for a, say, for a quark, interacting with, with, with a gluon field is just the product of the current operator of the quark and the uh, gluon field representing the, the, the gluons inside the target. These are all at this level quantum operators. These are just 
pass integral. The expectation value of that is a pass integral where both the gluon fields here and the quark field here have to be integrated over and all that. So it's, it's a full QCD. But of course, we, we cannot do full QCD. So the question, how do, we, how do we compute things in practice? And the point is that uh, at high energy, there are important approximations. So in, in, a priori, G mu is a color current for the particle in the projectile. If the current, if the particle was a quark, that was the expression of the, of the current operator, psi bar and psi uh, Dirac operators. And A mu is a color field in the gluon field from the target. But at high energy, the structure of the interaction gets drastically simplified. First of all, just by kinematics, because the current is a right mover, and since the current is proportional to the velocity of the particle, the a right moving ultra relativistic particle has only one component, what the advantage of using like on coordinate has only a plus component. So the current has only a plus component, which means that the coupling between the current and the color field of the target only involves the minus field in the target. That's a trivial simplification to the object, but it's, but it's important. So instead of G mu A mu, you have G plus A minus. Less trivial and most equally important is that during the scattering described by this uh, S matrix I shown to you here, in the high energy regime, one can ignore the change in the transverse coordinate of the quark. So this is a picture of the scattering in momentum space, that's a picture in coordinate space. They're the same that all that they don't, don't look like. In momentum space, the quark enters the nucleus. That, that's supposed to be the nucleus, a, a slice of the nucleus, from zero to L, where L is the original width of the nucleus in a generic frame. So if R was the radius of the, the most precise, that's the nucleon. See? If R was the radius of the nucleon, then L is R divided by gamma now, where gamma is the Lorentz factor. So it's just a generic frame. The quark comes inside the nucleus with zero transverse momentum. It scatters of, of, of say, valence quarks from inside the nucleus by changing gluons, and it gets kicks, and these kicks give standard momentum, which add together to give the final p-perp. That's quite a picture in momentum space, but the main point is that if one computes this, this scattering in, in transverse coordinate space, then one can neglect the change in the transverse coordinate between the incoming point and outgoing point. X-perp here and out there are the same. Why? Well, because, the, of course, there are small deviations, but these deviations are irrelevant if they remain smaller than the transverse wavelength lambda perp of the quark, because then we cannot measure them. The, if you work in quantum mechanics, the transverse position of a particle cannot be defined with a resolution better than, than his own wavelength. So if the change in the transverse position is smaller than the wavelength lambda perp, which is one over p perp here, then that change is just physically irrelevant, unobservable. Now let me show that that's in this case. So I compute the change delta x perp associated with the change p perp in the momentum. That change delta x perp is the transverse velocity, which is p perp divided by the energy of the incoming energy of the quark, times the, uh, so that's the velocity times the distance crossing the medium L. So p perp divided by E times L, where L, I remind you, was itself L divided by gamma. From here. So, and I want to check that this, uh, this change delta x perp is more than one over the, the lambda perp, which is itself one over p perp. So this condition implies that, that um, p perp squared uh, should be bigger than e divided by l, if you want. Or p perp squared times l bigger than a. Sorry, it's more than e. Uh, well, whatever. Let me write it down. So the condition is like that. p perp squared times l much more than e. So if the energy e of the incoming quark is much bigger than the, trans than the ex original extent of the medium, L, times the transit moment which is acquired squared, then uh, the equal approximation is, is fine because this isn't quite satisfied. Now, L is R divided by gamma. And P perp is of order of Q sub squared because that's the typical momentum of the gluons. So any of the momenta here is of order QS and that overall momentum of order QS as well. So the condition we need is that gamma E much bigger than R times QS squared. And now, if we use the, the typical values for, say, for the nucle nucle uh, nuclear radius, R is 5 Fermi, typical, uh, 5 to 10 Fermi. QS is about 1 GeV, to, 1 to 2 GeV, 1 to 2 GeV. And the energy gamma E is the same as the energy center of mass at the, at the Tevatron, uh, sorry, at the LHC, which is, which is, uh, um, uh, in the center of in the, in the rest frame, sorry, the energy in the rest frame, which is about 10 to 6 GeV. It's 10 to power 3 in the, in the center of mass frame, but it's 10 to power 6 in the, in the, in the rest frame. So these inequalities 
is very well satisfied, as you can see. So with a very high accuracy, the Econ approximation is, is, is a quiet approximation. So one can ignore the change in transverse coordinate. And why this is important? Because X perp appears to be a good quantum number. And then the, the multiple scattering theory is very easy to, 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 to resum in the Econ approximation. But that, 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 that statement that the transverse coordinate of the, of the projectile is not modified by the interaction is known as the Econ approximation. It means, it means that the structure of the current is, is drastically simplified. The current has only a plus component, of course, but moreover, this plus component uh, has the same trajectory as in the absence of the interaction. So it, it's, a, it's a ultra relativistic right mover, so it has V egal T or X minus equals zero, and it has some transverse coordinates which is fixed. I call it here X perp zero. So the X perp is a density in X, so the, the current density at X is it's, it's a delta function at X zero, where X zero is the actual position of the quark. But in a moment, I will, take, I will replace X zero by, by X. So that's the current. The current is very, it's a, it's, a it's a current of a classical colored particle, which moreover is not deviated by the interaction. So it, it's, a, it's the same as the current of a classical free moving particle. And that's an approximation, a non trivial approximation, it's not trivial at all, but it, 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 it's a right property at high energy. They say differently, high energy particles are not deflected by the interactions. That's what it is. It's a, they behave as classical particles without doing a classical approximation. It's a property of the kinematics and not a property of dynamics. So, because the current is so simple, one can just replace G mu by this expression here. You see, I have I had four integration: the one over x minus is trivial, the one over x perp, just fixing x perp to be x perp zero, which is again trivial. Only integration I, I left with is x, x, x plus integration. So I have. G plus A minus, which I have here. G plus is just delta mu plus. So sorry, it's just a GTA. You can see GTA here. And I have the minus component of the car of the of the field in the target. I wrote here. At, at X perp equal to X perp zero, but now I, I do not generic that with X perp. And uh, at any X plus, or X plus is a time along the trajectory of the of the quark. I remember that the quark is a right mover, so X plus is a right on time for the right mover. And that's the same as the longitudinal coordinates for the, for the left mover. And uh, the integration over x plus here simply means an integration over the trajectory of the quark inside the, quark, inside the nucleus. So at all the points of this trajectory inside the nucleus, the quark can scatter of the color field at those points. And I have to integrate over all these interactions, all the, all the scatterings. And I have to order the matrices according to the time of interaction. This is the, the symbol of the time, or time ordering operator here. This is a matrix here, so the, 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 there's no commutation between these matrices, and, and, and there's a T symbol, which is telling me that I have to put the matrices to, toward, from left to right in increasing order of the time arguments, because the quark enters from the, from the left, from small x plus, x plus is increasing, so this matrix here comes after this one, this matrix here comes after that, and after that, and so on. So this, Time, time order exponential of a Wilson line along the Lycon is called, sorry, of a gauge field along the Lycon is called the Wilson line. That's a fundamental quantity. It's a fundamental degree of freedom at high energy. Any high energy parton interacts with a, with a gluon field of the target via Wilson lines. And the basis of Wilson lines represent the basis for all the interaction at high energy. So any effective theory for high energy scattering is written in terms of Wilson lines. So because it's an exponential time order, it's exponential, it's clear that it is described multiple scattering to all orders because I have, can expand the Wilson lines to arbitrary order. I can have one scattering, two scattering, and scattering. It's a color matrix in the fundamental representation because the representation is set up by the projectile. I have small TA matrices at all the vertices. If the projectile was a gluon, a hard gluon, I would have here uh, the ideal representation. It's a, it's, a, it's a unitary matrix, you can look at it. So, so it means that uh, V, V dagger is one, this is just a statement that, in general, the S matrix should be a unitary matrix. So it's a proper, it's a statement about uh, um, conservation of the probability. So any S matrix has to be unitary. This is manifest unitary because it's a, it's a matrix for S, U, and C. So it's manifest unitary. And the fact that it is um, a phase, which is a unitary phase, is it means that it describes just a color rotation of the quark state. So if I define psi the wave function of the quark, in the transverse coordinate and the color representation, so x perp is the coordinate of the quark, which is a good quantum number, x perp before is perp after, i is the color state before, j is the color state after, then the final state here, which is this one here, is obtained from the initial state just by multiplying by this color matrix. So the only effect of the scattering 
is to rotate the color from I to J with the amplitude VJI, which is the matrix element of this, map, of this um, Wilson line, at the, evaluated at the transverse coordinate of the quark, which is constant. So the interaction in coordinate space is very simple. To all order in the scattering, but in the high energy limit, the interaction in coordinate space is very simple. Once you know the interaction in coordinate space, if you want to go back to the interaction in momentum space, because this is what we like to compute, we like to compute the transverse momentum of the final quark, then you just make a Fourier transform. I'll show that in a moment. But as a general rule, at high energy, one is always working in, in transverse coordinate space as much as possible. <coughs> and at the very end, one just projects the result by via Fourier transform on momentum states. So what is really a Wilson light? Most of you know, but let me, let me be, be complete on that point because it's a, very, it's, a, it's a basic degree of freedom for what follows. So, it's a time order exponential. How do you define time order exponential? The simplest way is, is, to, is to understand that by discretizing time. So the total interval of time, let me call it, um, uh, was L before. Let me call it, uh, I, I divide L into small, n small intervals epsilon. So xn is an n interval, and when a small n is equal to n, I, I, got, I got L. So I go from 0 to L in discretized steps. Then I have to order the matrices from left to right in increasing order of the time argument. Since in our way of writing things in a Latin character at least, we act to the operator on the right, the first interaction is put to the right of the chain. So this is the first interaction here, A0. So A0 means at the time zero. Then the next one at time X1 is put on the left on it, which means it's the second one, see, it's a, it's a, it, goes deep, it goes different in the figure and in the, in the writing, just because we're going to act with the operator on the right, as here. So the first one is A0, the second one is AN, A1, and so on, and the last one is AN. In e any of these small, small Wilson lines, I can forget about the time ordering, because now I can expand each of these small exponentials only to linear order in epsilon. And to linear order in epsilon, the time ordering is irrelevant. So e any of these, exponential with, with small epsilon here is identical with 1 plus ij epsilon a. But uh, this product of n, capital N, uh, infinitesimal rotations, in the limit where n goes to infinity with epsilon going to zero, such way that the n times epsilon is equal to L, defines precisely the, uh, the Wilson line written in, in continuum notation here. If you want, this notation is just a formal notation. The actual Wilson line is this. Okay, so now, now I know how a, Wilson, a, a, a quark with a V transverse coordinate interacts with a target. I will use in a moment that information to compute uh, particle production in PA collisions, so I, to compute what I shown here. But before that, let me make a, uh, take another example. So I say I, I keep moving between PA collision and DIS. Let me take DIS as an example. So let me remind you the dipole factorization for DIS working in the, in, the, in the dipole frame, and I will choose to work in a, in a frame where the dipole fluctuates in the quark anti quark pair, and the whole evolution is put in the proton. You see, I can always choose the frame the way I like. So for the time being, I choose an intermediate frame in which the evolution belongs to the proton, which means the proton carries most of the energy, but the, the visual photon has enough energy to split in the quark anti quark pair dipole before scattering. So this picture here lends itself to a simple factorization. The total cross-section for the interaction between the gamma star and the proton, which is a boost invariant quantity, can be computed in this frame as the convolution between the probability for gamma star to split into quark anti quark dipole, that's computed in QED because it's just a QED vertex there, times the cross-section for the QQ bar dipole to scatter with the proton, which is computed in QCD. The QQ bar pair comes from a photon, which means that the overall color state of the QQ bar pair has to be zero. It's a color singlet state. How do you build a color single set out of two particles in the fundamental representation, the quark and anti-quark? Well, you we just take the most symmetric combination of the color states of the quark and the anti-quark. It is red, anti-red, blue, anti-blue, green, anti-green, with symmetric, with equal coefficients. This overall singlet, these overall states of quark and anti-quark are symmetrized, fully symmetrized. It's a single state, and that's why they call the dipole. So now we come to what is called the dipole factorization for DIS, and that's, that's generic. All the processes I'm going to describe in my follows have similar factorization at high energy. 
we would like to compute the total cross section for gamma star proton scattering. We use the optical theorem. The total cross section is the imaginary part of the forward amplitude. So then I want to compute the forward amplitude for the scattering between a gamma star and a shock wave. Forward means that the gamma star comes, splits into quark antiquark dipole. The quark antiquark dipole scatters of the nucleus, depending on the shock wave, and then it recombines back in, in a color singlet state, which gives the photon again. So it's a, it's a forward amplitude. And this, this whole process has a QED part, which is a splitting of the gamma star into Q bar, and a QCD part, which is a scattering between the dipole and the shock wave. The QED part is, part is trivial. It just, the fact that it's a quark is irrelevant. It just defines the charge of the quark. It could be an electron and a positron. So the, 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 the splitting of a of photon into, into electron positron pair or quark antiquark pair is something which is well known in QED. It's, it's, I have one wave function here. I have a complex conjugate wave function there. So altogether, I have this module squared of the wave function, which describes the splitting of gamma star into QQ bar pair. For, a, uh, for incoming gamma star with a given Q squared, a given Q plus, and for a dipole pair, which has given air, and a given energy fraction Z for the quark, and one minus Z for the anti-quark. So the splitting of the energy between quark and air. So the energy of the, of the, what, the relational moment of the photon was Q plus, and that of the quark is Z Q plus, that one anti-quark is one minus Z Q plus. So the wave function is, is differential in R and Z, and then I have to integrate over all the R's and all the Z, because I can create a dipole with any size R, and any logical fraction Z for the quark, given the kinematics of the external uh, photon. So that's the probability for the splitting of the gamma star into QQ bar pair. And then what remains is the QCD part, what is called sigma dipole, is a total scattering uh, cross section between the dipole and, and, the, and the nucleus. That's given by QCD. That's a non trivial part that we'd like to compute. Uh, that is QED, it's trivial, that's a non trivial, it's QCD. Uh, in principle, here, one integrate over all the possible dipole sizes. But as I often stated, the, the, the visual photon acts as an analyzer with on transverse area of order Q squared, one over Q squared. And indeed, this convolution here is such that it is controlled by dipole size this R of order one over QS or Q squared. So in reality, this R, although it is integrated over, this integral is picked at one over Q. So for all purposes, one can, from the time one to no one, think about the dipole size R as being conjugated to the virtuality of the incoming photon. Uh, so uh, now we're going to focus on, on the QCD part, the dipole cross section. So the dipole cross section. The total, the, now, now I, I, I just focus on the dipole scattering, say, of a proton or a nucleus. Doesn't matter if this is a proton, it's a trivalent spark. I, I, again, I use the, the, um, the optical theorem. The total dipole cross section is twice the imaginary part of the scattering amplitude. T is the scattering amplitude. And at high, at high energy, it's purely imaginary, so I don't put the I any longer. That would be the imaginary part of the conventionally defined scattering amplitude, but I multiply the conventionally defined by an I because it's purely imaginary at high energy anyway, it's purely absorptive. So T is the imaginary part of scattering amplitude, and it's real by itself, because the um, Im scattering amplitude is purely imaginary. So what is T? It's a scattering amplitude, a forward scattering amplitude for a dipole with size R and impact parameter B. What is the size R? It's the difference between the transverse coordinate X and Y of the quark and the anti-quark, the dipole size. What is B? It's the center of mass of the dipole, so it's X plus Y over 2. And it's, it's a, the B it tells us the impact parameter of the dipole with respect to the nucleus. Does the dipole hit the nucleus at the center or towards the periphery? Where R is telling us the dipole size. So R is telling us the resolution of the dipole in the transverse plane, while B is giving us the position of the dipole in the transverse plane. Often one can neglect the B dependence. One can say, okay, the, the dipole hits a big nucleus, and if air is much bigger than, much more than the dipole, uh, than the, the nuclear radius, and if the, the dipole hits the nucleus somewhere towards the center, then there is no B dependence, because towards the center, the nucleus is quasi homogeneous. And I will, will often do this approximation. But for the time being, I keep, I keep both dependencies, dipole size and dipole impact parameter, or equivalently, X perp and Y perp. So T is 1 minus S, the, the 1 minus the dipole amplitude, and the dipole amplitude I'll construct in a moment. Um, this T is constrained by unitarity. So the, 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 the fact that the cross-section must obey unitarity bound implies that T at any fixed B has to, to obey the unitarity bound. T cannot exceed unity. That's probability conservation. So now how do I compute S and T? So I have to scatter two Wilson lines, sorry, two, 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 two uh, fermions, a quark and anti-quark of a nucleus. 
I already anticipated that I'm going to use the, the transverse coordinate representation because that's most useful at, at high energy. The transverse coordinate x perp and y perp are not modified by the scattering. They're good quantum numbers. So then the scattering is very simple. I have a Wilson line for the quark at x perp, and I have another Wilson line for the anti quark at y perp. The Wilson line for the anti quark is a Hermitian conjugate of the Wilson line for the quark. Just because an anti quark has charge minus g and propagates backwards in time according to Feynman conventions. So I have v of x perp for the quark. V dagger of y for the anti quark. These two Wilson lines must be traced over color. Why traced over color? Because I start with a color single state. So the color indices on the quark and the anti quark should be the same and it should be average over. And I want to compute this, the, the forward amplitude. So I want to end up again in a color single state, as I shown here. So I have to also make a sum over the final colors. So the sum and average over the initial colors and the sum over the final colors create altogether a tr color trace. So what I said here, yes. No, 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 nothing to do, nothing to do. No, no, no. The, the Z here is the sharing of the energy fraction of the gluon of the of the photon between the quark and the anti quark. Typically, one half. Yeah, but what is the small x in the? The small x is going to be associated. Uh, let me go get again here. The small x is going to be fully associated with the gluon distribution inside the inside the target. So I'm, I'm viewing the scattering in a frame where the whole small x evolution is inside the target. So the small xg is here. And this small x is defined, so the, the, the DIS, um, the DIS um, um, kinematics tells me what Birkin x. That Birkin x is divided almost equally between z and y minus z because that's one one half. And any of them, which is essentially Birkin x over two if you want, any of them sees so the, the, this this uh, this so the x here essentially Birkin x. So the x the Birkin x now is at the level of the gluon distribution inside modulo some small bias coming from the from the z distribution here, which is very picked around one half. Yes. Uh, here is a single scattering. I, I didn't. That's just a picture. That's, that's the matter. If I put here w w another gluon, uh, see, the single scattering, so the multiple scattering does not occur uh, against uh, the same chain. If I have a, se a second scattering, I have another chain and, and scattering. So you can, you can imagine n, n chains and n scatterings. But my, 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 this picture is just for simplicity, but the calculation of Wilson lines contains arbitrary many scatterings. So I have one Wilson line for the quark, a Hermitian conjugate for the anti quark. I sum over initial color indices i here. I sum over the infinite j, and I average over the initial state because the initial state can be any color state. I don't know which one, but any one. And this, you can recognize a trace of v, v of x, v dagger of y, divided by mc. So this is the S matrix for a dipole with a quark at x and an anti quark at y. It's a, it's a trace of two wheels on line. It's an operator because this is a functional of the field inside the target. That field is not a classical field. It's supposed to present the gluons there. So I have to tell how I average over it. But I, for the time being, I just work at the fixed configuration of the gluon. So what's next? So once I know how to scatter of a fixed configuration of the, of the gluons inside, I meaning for a fixed A minus, now I have to average over the color fit in the target to compute the observable. This color fit is random. A priori should be a pass integral, but again, at high energy, this pass integral simplifies dramatically because the color fields here are frozen by Lorentz time dilation, and they can each configuration, each quantum configuration, scatters independently of the other one. So I can scatter of a fixed quantum co configuration, neglect quantum fluctuations, and then average over the various classical configuration I scatter off with a color glass uh, condensate uh, weight function. And I suppose uh, Raju has introduced that already, right? Raju has spoken about the color glass uh, uh, y function. And I'm going to discuss again. For the time being, just, I don't specify, just imagine that there is, there is an, uh, a, weight, a weight for this average, a, a gauge invariant functional probability distribution, a function of A minus. It's gauge invariant, it's very important. The operator is gauge invariant as well. Of course, A minus itself is not in gauge invariant, but I can build a gauge invariant function out of A minus with a measure here. It's a functional measure. And this average is defining for me the expectation value of the S matrix, which means the, the, the physical S matrix. And the one minus theta matrix is the physical T matrix, the physical amplitude. And then this gives the physical dipole cross section. And then going backwards one step, I also get the physical uh, uh, DIS cross-section. So that's the way one computes. Just factorization. 
the dynamics will be in a moment, the dynamics will, will, will be in the calculation of this expectation value because this is just function of, of the gauge field. But the result of the averaging here depends upon the weight function, depends upon the properties quite similar about the Gluon distribution here. And that will be a real function of X minus Y, not a function any longer. Yes. So this uh, quark and anti quark of the dipole, yes. uh, will there be no interaction between them? I mean, there can be a gluon exchange in the quark anti quark pair, right? They don't interact with each other because that would be a higher order. That would be a small effect. The, 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 see, the, the field in the target is strong. Interacting with that field once, twice, n times is equally important. But the field created by the quark and felt by the anti quark is non zero, but it's small. It's a dilute, so the quark and the anti quark merge together a dilute system. So they can interact with each other, but that would be a higher order effect. Cancel. So to be powers of G squared, not multiplied by high gluon density. I only the sum power of G, if you look at the Wilson line. This is formally off order, all order in G. But there is a reason for that, because A minus is a strong field, it's one over G. So the exponent of order one, that's why I have to resum it. If I was doing dilute, dilute scattering, then A minus would be of order one, then I could, uh, I could limit myself to a final number, the expansion of the Wilson line. The rescattering of the quark and the anti quark inside the dipole, it's a high order effect. It exists, but it's a high order effect. The dipole interacts in a first approximation with the nucleus, not with itself. It's a dilute system, it's a dilute dense system. Yeah, that, 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 that's very important. If you were to compute the nucleus, nucleus scattering would be much more complicated because this simplification will disappear. We have the interaction inter, in, in, scattering inside the projectile, inside the target, in, in between. So you do the high energy approximation for all the Z. Mm -hmm. Can you estimate the error that you make in doing that? It's a, uh, for instance, the equal approximation is, is good up to correction in, is suppressed by inverse powers of the energy. So it's a very, very good approximation. And then the evolution is going to, the evolution is going to sum only terms in the, in the, in the quantum evolution, in the particle evolution, where each power for alpha s is multiplied by, by log i more 1 over x. So that's a leading log approximation at high energy. So there are two types. The equal approximation is extremely robust. The other one is a linear log approximation. And then, of course, when I have multiple scattering, there will be also the, the idea that the field, as I said, the field scales like 1 over g. And that, why? Because, in fact, the, the two-point function of the field, which is the gluon distribution, is of order 1 over alpha s. I will look at occupation numbers of order 1 over alpha s. And since the occupation number is a two-point function of the gauge field, effect, well, I'm going to compute correlators anyway. But it, just for power counting purposes, when I have a Wilson line before taking any average, I know that the field up there is 1 over g. So all that is under control by powers of G, always. Good. So the whole, so, so far, it look, looks very interesting, but that was kinematics and factorization. That's trivial. The non-trivial part is this. I mean, with writing a dipole for, uh, with writing a pair of Wilson lines for a dipole, it's automatic almost at high energy. The question is how do you compute the expectation value? And the dynamics come here. The, the, what is, the real dynamics is inside the target. The projectile is trivial, it's a quark and quark pair, period. And that's what it is here. But the dynamics is the color grass weight function. What is the distribution of the color in the target? How do we compute that from first principle? Like we compute that from first principle. Sorry, question. Uh, why is the average of the scattering matrix uh, real? Because the, the scattering matrix is, itself doesn't have to be real, right? Of course not. It is not in general. I'll show you. The, so, at high energy, the probability for having elastic scattering is suppressed by one of the energy. Whenever you compute really a process at high energy, you don't find elastic scattering in the first approximation. And you're going to see. I'm going to make a question for you. You'll see it's real, right? All the examples show it is real. It can have. You can. You can. You can select by 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 the observable you choose uh, imaginary part. If you look at the order on amplitude, it's imaginary. Yes. Yeah, so in, in MB, for example, it's. It, one can compute that is real. Yeah, because there's no other component. Yeah. You, can, you can force an other component going to be imaginary, but that's because you look for, you look for very exclusive final states. But uh, typically, if you, don't, if you look for inclusive final states, it's, it's always real. OK, so before I show you, right, before I show you how to compute this expectation value in a non-trivial setup, which means with no unit effect of all order, let me just recover first the limit of the single scattering. Because it's, it's, uh, I, I built a complicated formalist with Wilson lines and all that just because I wanted to do some multiple scattering to all orders. But the single scattering should be trivial. 
it should be the same as in coin factorization that everybody knows. So, we don't, so in a way, it's a check of the formalism and also a way to show that you don't need too much, too much information about the target to discover the standard information about the single scatter. So let me do that, the single scattering. The single scattering approximation, what does it mean? It means that you have, if, the, if, the, if the target itself is dilute, which means if the field A minus in the target is weak, then you can expand the Wilson lines. The leaning order term is linear, but you also need to know, have to go to the quadratic order. Why you have to go? Because you have two wheels on lines. You have two wheels on lines. And if you take the linear one from here, the linear one from there, you construct a two-point function of the gauge fields. But you can also take a quadratic piece from, from here times the one from there. It will be a tad for contribution. To, to be consistent to quadratic order in the gauge fields, you have to go in which of the wheels on lines up to quadratic order. You can take the linear term here times the linear term from there, or the quadratic term from here times the unity from here, and all the quadratic term from here times the unity from there. So this is what I do. I expand the Wilson lines to quadratic order. The linear term doesn't care about time ordering. The quadratic term already does care because I have two orderings. If the, if the second insertion x plus is bigger than y plus, I have a after b. If y plus is bigger than x plus, then I have b after a. You see, x plus is uh, it should be a b here. Sorry, it should be a, a minus b here. B is with y plus and a is with x plus. So. I, I order the matrices depending upon the ordering of the scattering. Nevertheless, when I compute the single scattering approximation, I have to take a trace. And since I multiply the, the two gluonic piece of here with a unity piece of there, the trace automatically is taken over this uh, the combination of trace TATB, which gives a delta AB. So both contributions count to the same footing, and the color non commutativity does not play any role in the single scattering approximation, it only play a role behind single scattering. And then the, the dipolar matrix is very simple. So it's S is one from the unity and times the, the expectation value. I, well, that's, I'm open. Times uh, um, uh, um, um, binomial in the gauge fields. We have, you see, um, um, cross term A of A minus of X perp, A minus of Y perp, which comes one, sorry, one A minus from here, one A minus from there. And then you have A minus of X perp squared which we take the quadratic piece here at x perp, and then a similar one, y perp squared, which we take the quadratic piece in the other with line at y perp. Here there is no x plus in the, uh, in the uh, variable anymore. x plus is integrated over. So this variable is a variable. It's a, this is a field project in the trans dimension. That's generic at high energy. One is only interested in the integration over the fields, over, the, over everything, over the rotational direction. Because one scatters, see, one has Lorentz contraction. So, in fact, this property is, is, is so generic that people forget about the fact that, that X plus can play a role whenever you have time ordering. So in reality, you see, if you look at the Wilson lines here, what I'm doing, sorry. If you look at the Wilson lines definition here, you have an equation with X plus here. So you can say, okay, I can replace the exponent by the field integrate of X plus. No, I cannot because I have the T matrices here. We have to order them at the right time. So, so long as the, 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 the ordering of the matrices play a role, I cannot replace a three-dimensional field in X plus and X perp by just the projection around X plus. Although I have to sum up over all the scatterings, because I have to, uh, to integrate over the trajectory of the quark from here to there, or along the, all the distance L, so the integration here is from zero to L if you want. But I cannot replace the, 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 the individual fields at each separate X plus by the sum of all the fields, because different X pluses have different color matrices and they don't commit with each other. So that's a generic situation. That's a situation with multiple scattering. It is never true that in, in the weak scattering limit or the BF Kyle limit or the Lipatov limit, then one has only a single scattering. The scattering can occur anywhere and one can just integrate the effect of that scattering anywhere and then one can replace the three-dimensional field by the two-dimensional projection of it. And this is what I, I, I've seen explicitly here when I show to you, yes, that, that, uh, that the field which appears here is just the integral of the field of the over all rotational, rotational uh, structure of the nucleus. And now this is a quadratic form in the gauge field in the target. Now I have to, aver I have to average over the target and independently, independently of the procedure with for the averaging, the expectation value of the two-point function is just the gluon distribution by definition. More precise is the gluon distribution of the target is the expectation value of fi minus fi minus or fi minus is a, uh, yes, fi minus is a field strength tensor which is pi a minus a in this notation. 
in this gauge. And you see that here I have essentially the difference between the field at x per minus y per. I can expand that in x minus y, and then I generate precisely these derivatives times an error squared. So no surprisingly, the expectation value of this is a standard Gluon distribution. So the s matrix in the single scattering approximation reproduces the property that the dipole cross-section in the single scattering approximation is a direct measure of the Gluon distribution of the target. That's a well-known statement. This has nothing to do with the multiple scattering. That's a single scattering uh, property. In the single, we, that's leading to this result. What, what, what you are asking, what are the observables? Well, so long as you have a single scattering, you do measure just a standard Gluon distribution because you just measure a, a two-point function of the Gluon field in the target. But the multiple scattering is going to, to, to measure also higher endpoint function, which are going to be sensitive to the actual longitudinal structure of the field. So they're going to, to, to probe the, the detail of the X plus integration, and I'm going to have more and more complicated correlation functions with no locality in X plus, which are going to be explored by the scattering, by the multiple scattering. So at the level of single scattering, I don't need any theory because by construction, the two point function of the gauge field is a gluon distribution. I can take that from the phenomenology. But if I want to go beyond the single scattering approximation, I need a theory for computing, for computing this expectation value here. Yes. So I had a question. So when you so when you wrote down the I mean when you wrote down the gluon distribution. Yeah, I, I I I just step this I, I jump this step. No, no no one slide further. So I was about the scale, right? So I, yeah, yeah. So you. Yeah, so, squared, so, the scale is given by the by the difference x minus y, which is six, because that's the dipole size, which is eventually integrated over in the in the dipole wave function to be over the q squared. So so what's the easiest way to see this explicitly? I mean. Um, well, uh, at the level of the, the uh, yeah, well, you'll see in a moment, as soon as I compute that effectively in any model, I will, uh, that will, will have a logarithmic evolution, upon, which depends upon what the upper scale in the logarithm will be 1 over x minus y squared. But to see it explicitly, you'd have to compute the next uh, Yeah, yeah. The next it, it, comes, it always comes from a normalization procedure. You have to integrate, you have to compute something to, to compute the integration with the gluon fields to see that you have a UV divergence, and that divergence is, is cut off naturally at that scale. And yeah, okay. yeah that, that was going to be explicit in, in the MV model in a moment. Okay, so, uh, so that was the dipole, the dipole um, scattering, dipole cross section, the single scattering approximation, it's just a measure of the gluon distribution inside the target at the resolution scale Q squared fixed by the dipole size, which eventually is the same as the virtuality of the, di of the, of the, of the virtual photon in DIS. So it, it's right. Um, but, and, and, and by the way, not that the di di dipole cross-section vanishes as R squared when R goes to zero, when the dipole size goes to zero. This is just a statement that a dipole of zero size cannot scatter because this is a quark anti quark dipole. So the, the, the only non-trivial moment of a, of a color, uh, quark anti quark dipole, they're on top of each other, they have no dipole moment, it's zero charge, zero dipole moment, they cannot scatter. And how this dipole size squared appear in the calculation, I return to this formula from here. You see, I have the difference between the field at x at the quark, the difference at y minus under quark. If x and y are the same, it's zero, of course. I have expanded out that in a difference x minus y, which produces the, the size x minus y. I have a square that produces x minus y squared, that produces r squared. So that's the that property is called, called transparency, but it's the same as electric transparency of a dipole in QED. A dipole in, electron proton dipole in QED of zero size is not a dipole. It's a, it's a, it's a trivial object that does not interact at all. The same here. A zero size color dipole does not interact at all. So these properties, the fact that, that uh, the dipole amplitude, so cross section in the, in the limit of the single scattering in proportion to R squared, small R squared, sorry, and also to the Gluon distribution are generic properties. Uh, they didn't rely on any model here. I didn't use any information about the structure of the, the nucleus. I just used the definition of the gluon distribution as a two-point function. Okay. But now I want to go to multiple scattering because I want to have unitarization. If you look at this cross-section from here, it can become arbitrarily large. Why? Because um, the gluon distribution goes like power 1 over x. Uh, and um, uh, this will violate eventually Professor about because you know the cross-section cannot grow faster than the logarithm of the energy, or this cross section here goes like a power of the energy because one over x bjork and x goes like power of the energy. So this is clearly a single scattering approximation. There's no reason not to violate unitarity. In order to restore unitarity, you have to 
to, um, to, um, to include multiple scattering. Don't forget that the Wilson lines were unitary. They were unitary matrices. But when I expanded that like that, I broke up the unitarization because this truncation of the Wilson line is not unitary anymore. So I, by making a single scattering approximation, I have explicitly broken a property which was built in in the Wilson line. I had unitarization, I just broke it by hand. I have to return to multiple scattering. I know I'm going to be unitary because I'm going to compute the expectation value of a unitary operator, but I have just to compute it. It's, it's more tough, but it's going to be unitary. So I want to do something like that. And for, for that purpose, I have to include multiple scattering. And for that purpose, I need a theory for the, for the nucleus, for the nuclear distribution in the target, including um, high density effect saturation. And that's a Kologras uh, effective theory. So it, it, it's, it's a semi classical but derived in PQCD effective theory in which the gluon field at the scale x of interest, say the scale x, which is plot by DIS at this level. Is created by the color charges at all the, um, the larger value of x, by, by all the partons with x prime bigger than x, starting with the valence parton, but including also all the gluons produced by the evolution with x prime bigger than x. All these fast sources are frozen by Lorentz time dilation. So during the very short duration of the scattering at this level, the scattering of the, uh, on the scale set by x, all the sources here are frozen in a fixed configuration. So one has no quantum interferences between this configuration in amplitude and a different configuration in complex conjugate amplitude. That's the fundamental property. That's why one can use classical approximation. It's not a semi-classical expansion. It's just a property suppressed by powers of the energy. Because this configuration of color sources and charges can only interfere with each, with this, cannot interfere with any other configuration. Doing the scattering, I have the same, exactly the same configuration in the amplitude and in the complex conjugate amplitude. So this is controlled by powers of the energy, not by the powers of the coupling. So this is a very strong approximation, very powerful approximation, as powerful as the acorn approximation. And then one can use the modulus squared of this amplitude as a classical probability distribution. The only issues going behind full quantum calculations and behind power of and energy are T matrices, color matrices. One is not going to use all the possible representation for all these thematics here. That would be co too complicated. So one is going to, one is implicitly performing a classical average, or classical approximation on the color structure. In, on, an approximation on SUN, not on QCD. The, the approximation on QCD is very good. The approximation on SUN is less good, but you have many, many sources. You can replace, uh, uh, say, a um, um, uh, group valued um, distribution of charges with a classical color charge density. That's what I'm going to do, what I call raw. And uh, it is going to be a normalization group analysis, which is going to build the color glass wave function at this level by successively integrating new layers of quantum fluctuations in, 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 uh, by, when decreasing x. When, when you make x smaller and smaller, new sources have to become a part of the, of the wave function, and they have to be integrated over. And that's done by a quantum mechanical one-loop analysis, which is called the Jimok equation. And that will be the end of my lecture, the Jimok equation. But the first time, I mean, just assume that these procedures exist, that one knows how to in in integrate out uh, quantum fluctuations in the high energy approximation, including saturation effects like this one, to all orders in saturation. And since this is going to be an evolution equation, one also needs an uh, initial condition for it. And the initial condition for it is at low energy by definition, is where, where one can neglect all the evolution there. So one can assume that the, that the color field at the scale x of interest is directly produced by the valence spark. Let's call the mechanical when you go polar model. The only sources in the MV model are the valence sparks, no evolution. So do what I'm going to describe now. So the, the, the MV model is just a model for the initial condition of the GMOC equation. So as such, it's, it's a model like the GLAP equation needs an initial condition. All the evolution equation in PQCD are built rigorously in PQCD, but they need initial condition which are model dependent. And of course, for the model, for this, uh, for this initial condition, you have to choose a reasonable approximation and then fit parameters from the data. The same philosophy for the GLAP, for BFKL, for GMOC. So the MV model is a model for the gluon distribution in a large nucleus, means A much bigger than one but at not that small values of x, in the sense that one can ignore quantum evolution. Uh, why should you have A? Well, because a large nucleus has a, is a, it can be viewed as a correlation of A times NC uh, valence quarks. If A is 200 for the lead and NC is 3 for, uh, for fundamental quarks, you have like six, because you have three quarks per, per nucleon. And all these valence quarks can, can be, uh, 
can be viewed as independent color sources because they're confined into different nucleons that don't, don't stick to each other. And since they're independent, their distribution can be described by the Gaussian weight function. And the fact that there are many allows us to describe these many color valued, SVN group valued sources by a classical color chart distribution rho A, which is the argument of this Gaussian. So in this, in this model, the, the color graph weight function is simply a Gaussian. Rho A is a color charge density in, in three dimensions of the valence quarks. Uh, and uh, lambda a is, is, is so rho is, uh, lambda is a two-point function of this of, the, of this core chain. It's a Gaussian, so lambda is a two-point function. So if we just integrate lambda over a whole volume, we get the total color charge squared of the valence quarks. We have AMC valence quarks. The valence quarks of a single valence, the color charge squared of a single valence quark is GTA squared, which is G squared CF. So it has G squared CF times AMC, and you have to divide by the number of gluons because the total color charge squared of a given color by construction, because you have here delta AB, or A or A. So this is the total color charge squared of a, of a given type of, in color space, which means the total color charge squared of all the valence squares divided by the number of gluons. And it is convenient to parameterize that as the area of the nucleus times a density of color charge squared per unit transverse area. So lambda is a density per unit volume, including longitudinal uh, extent and transverse area, but at a high energy scattering only probes quantities integrated over X plus, the quantity which will appear in the final result is not going to be lambda, but mu. The mu squared is an integration over lambda over X plus. You see, the, the, the integral over X perp is the same as pi r squared. So if you, want, if you divide out, to x from here and pi r squared from there, you see that mu squared is a, is a name for the integration over lambda over x plus. The squared here, because mu is supposed to be viewed as a mass, mu squared a dimension of mass squared, well, mass, well, why mass squared? Because it's a color charge squared, which is dimensionless, per unit transverse area. So mu squared is very much like the, the saturation momentum of the nucleus. And in fact, in a moment, we will show that indeed saturation momentum of the nucleus in this model is proportional to mu squared. Because such a moment, I remember, is also the, the density of gluons, or more precisely, the color charge squared of the gluons per unit transverse area, which is what mu squared means. Okay, so as I just mentioned, the smallest observables cannot discriminate the local structure in X plus, they are going to be sensitive to mu squared. And this mu squared goes like A to power one third, because, um, uh, because the, uh, the um, because, yeah, right, because this is a quantity which is, goes like A, it's a total color charge squared of all the valence quarks and the number of valence quarks proportional to A, but the area squared of the nucleus in transverse plane goes like A to power two thirds. So, so you, you know that the radius of a nucleus goes like power one third. The, the transverse area of the nucleus goes to the power two thirds. If the, if the total color charge of all the valence quarks in the integrated over all the volume goes like power A, then the color charge squared per unit transverse area goes like A divided by A to power two thirds, which is like A one third. You, 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 it's okay with that? It's a simple argument, but it's important to keep in mind because this, is, this A1 third is a parametric enhancement in the end the model. You need a large A nucleus in order to have a large color charge density per unit transverse area, and that's realized by a factor A1 third, which is here. For a lead nucleus, it is, which is A is 200, this A1 third is 6. It's not that big. But NV model is supposed to be a good approximation when, when A goes to infinity. Otherwise, the model. Excuse me? How did you deduce that there will be a Gaussian weight function for the independent color sources? Well, just by definition, once you call them independent, uh, this is a different way to say that the way. Can you please explain what you mean by that uh, independent color sources? Can you? Uh, what I mean, look at the correlation. Look at the, so I, 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 I used, so the, the, yeah, let me compute the following object. X vector is X plus and X part. It's a three-dimensional coordinate, right? I use rho a of x, plus, of x, rho b of y. I compute that. How I compute it? I integrate over all the color fields with a color graph wave function, which is delta Gaussian, times the operator. I want to compute rho a of x, rho, a, rho b of y. That's the definition. Now I use the fact that this is a Gaussian. So what I get from there, it's a, it's a Gaussian which is local in x, perp, and x plus. So it's going to be and also in color. They're going to be a delta AB from, from color, the otherwise it would be known zero, or delta of X vector minus Y vector, which means delta X plus minus Y plus, delta of X perp minus Y perp, delta two of X plus minus Y perp, times lambda of X plus and X perp. 
that's what it is. And if I look at this, so you see, if I look at the correlator of the color charge density at two different points, I found that as soon as the two, the two points are really different, the quality is zero. There's no correlation. But if I look at the same point, of course, I measure the same charge twice. And that charge twice has a color charge, because then I have the square of that, I have the color charge squared of that very charge. That is lambda. So this, this is telling me that there is no correlation. And the only parameter if there is no correlation is the expectation value of local color charge squared density, which is lambda. So they're independent, because if I try to correlate some one, if I try to correlate two different charges, I got the result of zero. There's no correlation between them. But of course, each charge has its own color, and that's a color charge squared. Each quark has a charge T squared CF. So if I look at the single quark, his color charge squared, I know it. But if I look at two different charge, color, and I try to put the correlator between these two, two quarks, I got zero, because they're not uncorrelated. They're independent. OK. Um, so now I, I know the color charge, sorry. I know the color charge and the distribution of the color charge. In order to compute observable, like the dipole scattering, I have to compute Wilson lines. I have to compute first the gauge field and then the Wilson lines, right? So the MV model is naturally built in terms of the color charge distribution of the valence quark. It's a Gaussian because the color charge, because valence quark is independent. But once I know the color charge of the of, of distribution of the, of the sources, I have to use, I, I, I already mentioned, I'm using a classical approximation. I have to use Yamil's equation to first go from charge to fields and then exponentiate the field to get Wilson lines. And then, uh, then, then expect eventually, so uh, the, the strategy is, so one, I give a distribution of W, V0 of rho. It's a color charge rho. Two, I solve the classical Yamil's equation, D mu F mu mu. Is the current. The current, see, the source, it's a left mover. So this is a delta mu minus times rho A. Is A also. This is going to give me A minus A as a function of rho, rho A. Just solve the equation. I'll show you that in a moment how to do that. Then once I know A minus 3, I compute the Wilson line as a function of A minus. Then 4, I take two Wilson lines at x and y, and I compute the dipole operator as a function of A minus. Is one over nc trace v dagger x perp v y perp sorry v x perp v dagger y perp as a function of a minus and hence as a function of rho because a minus is known as function of rho and finally I use this information to average over rho with the color grass wave function as given by this Gaussian. I compute the classical field as a function of rho. I compute the Wilson line as a function of classical field as a function of rho. I compute the S matrix operator as a function of A minus as a function of rho, and I average over rho. And this gives me the physical S matrix, which is not a function of rho anymore because rho has been averaged out. It's a function of the dipole size, x perp and y perp, and as a function also of this parameter mu squared, which characterizes the gluon distribution in, in the target. The, the, the width of the Gaussian. But as I said, the width of the Gaussian will only appear in the integral ratio over x plus, which is p squared. And that will be explicit in the calculation. You don't have to <clears throat> guess it in advance, it will show up. So the strategy. The strategy is self to, to, self to solve classical Yamis equations. So are you familiar with Yamis, with, with Yamis equations? Have you ever worked with them? Of course, you're all familiar with Maxwell equations. But you know what's the difference between Yamils and uh, Maxwell? Is there, let me say, is there anyone who is not familiar with the difference between Maxwell and Young-Mills? As a matter of fact, you don't have to be familiar because it's going to be very, in this case, the high energy kinematics is magic. Uh, the, 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 it renders everything trivial. So Young-Mills equation is, is reputed for being very complicated in general, but in the case of the high energy kinematics, Young-Mills equation is as simple as Maxwell equation. That, that's a, that's an important specific. So what is Yamil's equation? It, it, it's an equation with d nu f mu nu equal j mu. But in this case, first of all, j mu is a current of a left mover, so it has only a minus component. And the, that left com so what I call rho a so far was really the density of the minus component of the target, right? Because it has only a minus component, so it's a left mover. D f mu nu here is a, it's a, a priori QCD strength tensor. 
So it, it is non-linear in the gauge field. It has a standard structure with the derivative as in QED, but you also have a quadratic piece which comes with a commutator of the field, so it's FABC symbol. So it's non-linear. So F mu is non-linear. And the derivative, we say, it's a covariant derivative, so it contains a term which is linear in the gauge field on top of the derivative. So viewed like that, the left-hand side, left side here can have terms which are up to three linear in the gauge fields, a derivative uh, A from here and A squared from there. So it looks like a very complicated nonlinear equation. Nevertheless, due to the special structure of the current, the solution is, is, is very simple because it is linear. So it is easy to check that whatever gauge you choose, the solution has the following property, that F i j is zero, a, a and j are the transverse components, one, one and two, that A plus is zero in any gauge, and that the only non-trivial components, which are, can be a i and a minus, are independent of x minus. Because the, uh, you see, the color charge of the target has no a minus. I, I, I forgot to, no x minus, I, I forgot to emphasize that, but it, it should be clear why. It's a left mover. x minus is a time for the left mover. But it is ultra relativistic, so it's fully Lorentz dilated. So they, it is totally frozen. That the distribution of charges is independent of x minus. Of x minus. In fact, the, expect, the color glass expectation value, this expectation value of a row, is just summing up over all the possible configuration that would be created in the history of the universe. But each of those is totally frozen during the scattering. Of course, they're not, scat they're not frozen over the history of the universe. They're frozen over the time of the scattering. So when you compute a single scattering, I have no x-minus dependence. But the fact that I average over many configurations is like allowing for a weak x minus dependence and allowing me to, to change configuration from time to time via a dynamics which is included in this weight function which does not matter for the scattering but, but it matters for the construction of the wave function of the target. So the scattering is of a given configuration which is frozen but the expectation value, the, the average over all the configuration is like taking into account effectively the, the x minus dependence of the actual dynamics. This is, this is what I call the glass, by the way. You know that the glass is something which looks like a, like a, like a solid on short time scale, but like a liquid on long time scale. So if, if you probe a glass, it looks like a solid state. But if you let it one million years, you'll find in probe it again, you'll find a difference in microscopic structure. It has evolved. It doesn't look to evolve. It looks like time independent. It is time independent. You can work with, with a full dynamics which is time independent, but then you have to average all, all the configuration. Take average over all the configuration of a glass is tantamount to allowing a very weak time dependence that goes behind the scale of the scattering experiment. So this is, yeah, maybe Raju already explained why the color glass is supposed to be. That's this is why the color glass is, uh, is coming. The name of the color glass is coming. Good. So the, 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 um, the, that equation with this source has very simple properties. And if you also fix the, that's independent of the gauge. If you also fix the gauge, say we fix the covariant gauge, d mu mu equals zero, then this, uh, because of the independent of x minus, d mu mu equals zero is the same as d i i zero, which means that the transverse components are independent of, of the transverse coordinates. And if they're independent of the transverse coordinates, they're, they're trivial because they're like constant gauge vectors. Or constant gauge vector is trivially equivalent to zero. We just can take ai is zero, so a plus is zero, ai is zero. You have only a single component, a minus, just a, called the Coulomb field. If you have a single component, there is no commutator, and then the, the equation becomes linear. So, due to the special structure of the current, the equation you have to solve is just Poisson equation in two dimensions. So, the, the whole operator here reduces to a two dimensional uh, Laplacian, d perp squared, and uh, acting on a minus equal to rho. That's a linear equation, anyone can solve it, even I can solve it. So I, I go to momentum space in transverse coordinate space from x perp to k perp, because it's a no local equation with the derivative here. And in momentum space, the, derivative, the solution is rho a of k perp divided by k perp squared. And then I'll go backwards to coordinate space by inverse Fourier transform, I go from k to x. And in doing that, I have to invert the two dimensional Laplace operator into the, uh, one over k perp squared. It so happened that this is a logarithm. Uh, you can see that by dimensional conservation, due to k over k perp, it has zero dimension, so it has to be a logarithm. And this logarithm has an infinite sensitivity. So the, this function, as a function of, of x perp, um, receives contribution from the color charges at all the points y perp, with the contribution of y perp propagating to x perp via this two dimensional Coulomb propagator, which requires an infinite cutoff, uh, con or confinement scale. That's, that's unavoidable, and, uh, but that would not have uh, any, any consequences for physics, actually, in a moment. 
But the physics wise, this is really the physics of confinement. So the Coulomb field in two dimensions knows about confinement. It's not just an approximation, it's a physics reality. The question is what are the observables which are built with the color field are still sent to lambda or not? I'll show you in a moment that they are not. But the Coulomb field knows about it. The Coulomb field itself is not an observable. The dipole S matrix is an observable. So since the only component of the field is A minus, then the only component of the field strength tensor is Fi minus, is the I A minus. And that's precisely the electric field which enters in the definition of the Coulomb distribution. Questions at this level? So we have a cutoff uh, of lambda. Yes, how, yeah. So, but the dipole size can be pretty big, right? Because we are saying yes, that the dipole, the dipole D is a quark and an anti-quark, and whatever goes to the, the to the confinement cancel between quark and the anti-quark. So the, the dipole doesn't care about lambda. So whenever you have a the statement, whenever you have a log dependence or to confinement scale, then any gauge invariant observable doesn't know about it. So when you see something like that, you say it's, it's not there. Because you know you're going to compute a gauge invariant observable. It's, it's, it's simply not there. You close your eyes, it's not there. But, but doesn't the dipole in MB have a logarithm in the exponential? That it's depends on. Have a, the, the, you're, you're going to see that. Is, yes, but that comes out from the correlator, yes. So, in a way, you're right. He does see it in, in that sense. Yeah. What is not present is in Fi minus, Fi minus addition. So it, it does through the evolution, you're right. It doesn't, in the classical approximation, it does it through the evolution. It's a very good point, you're right. So let me, um, good. So, so far, I have computed A minus because that's a field which enters the Wilson lines, right? Or I'm computer scattering. But I tell you that in principle, I have two types of non trivial components, AI and A minus. And it so happened that if I want to understand the gluon structure of the target in terms of part in terms of gluons, I don't need the A minus component. I need the, a, the AI component. Because what is A minus? Look at, look at this um, expression. A minus is a Coulomb field. Uh, minus is, is as, as in X plus as the original color charge. See? X plus is the same here and here. There's no, no locality. So these fields, precisely because it's a linear equation, the fields created by different sources add incoherently with each other. So there is no nonlinear physics. So you may ask, what is the physics of saturation? Well, the physics of saturation is simply not there in this gauge. The, physics of the idea of saturation is a gauge dependent statement. So if your purpose is just to complete multiple scattering, then you work in a gauge where there is no saturation in the target, but it's going to be multiple scattering because of the Wilson line are nonlinear function of A minus. So all the nonlinearities will come through the Wilson line. But if you ask the question, what is the actual structure of the gluons inside the target, then you have to specify the question. You speak about the gluons inside the target, you, you have in mind partons, but the partons don't exist in any gauge. The parton only is in the Lycon gauge of the target. And in that case, the Lycon gauge of the target for a, for a left mover is A minus equals zero. So let me do that. Let me go in the Lycon gauge of the target, A minus equals zero. When I put A minus equals zero, you see that all the arguments of the Wilson lines goes to, to, to zero. And you ask, how do I compute the scattering? In a complicated way. So computing the scattering in this gauge is, is very awkward. It can be done. Everything can be done in any gauge. But it's not, not the natural gauge for computing the scattering. I'm not going to show you how to compute scattering in this awkward gauge. But if you ask the question, what is the part on distribution at the level of textbook, at the, uh, as in Petsky and Schroeder, then you have to work in that gauge. Because only, if you look in Pelkin and Schroeder, they, they only speak about part on distribution. They use a right mover for in the gauge A plus equals zero. Now, in our case, that gauge is A minus equals zero. And uh, let me show you how the partons show up. So I have to solve the same equation, but in the gauge A minus equals zero. There would be large component, the one which is directly proportional with a, with a, with a charge, is forced to zero by, gauge, by the gauge of the choice. But by the way, that's the same as the radiation gauge for the Coulomb problem. Everybody solves the Coulomb problem by solving the Poisson equation for A0 in, in the gauge, in the, in the Coulomb gauge with di, ai equals zero. Then the, 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 the vector components ai are zero, and a0 is one over r. It's very simple. But what if I ask you, solve the Coulomb problem, the static charge, in the gauge where a0 is zero? You can do that. And then the, the, the field is an ai component, uh, and, and which depends upon time. So you have 
com the gauge field component, which depends upon time, which are vector-like, which describes physically the static, electro, the, the static electric field, the static Coulomb field. So that's just an awkward, awkward cho gauge, uh, choice of the gauge, but that awkward choice of the gauge is the only gauge when this part of picture makes sense, because part of picture is made in terms of propagating on-shell transverse gluons. The Coulomb field has no such a thing, but if you insist in, in uh, trying to give a part on picture for the Coulomb field, then you have to describe in terms of on-shell transverse propagating gluons. And this is AF, the radiation gauge. It looks complicated, but that's the, the, the part on structure. So uh, the part of structure is not very natural, but it's something very useful. Um, so I, I want to solve this equation in the, in, in, in the, in the gauge A minus equals zero. Then I have two components, A1 and A, A, A2, which will obey A5, J equals zero. But since I have two components, I have non trivial commutators. And hence, the, the equation is nonlinear anymore. It's not a linear equation. So to, 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 to make it simple, let me solve first the, the weak field version of it. So let me linearize it. If I linearize this, I can, I can solve it by, by Fourier transform. And the, the AI field is given by this three-dimensional inverse Fourier transform of the field AI in the, in the transit moment, in, 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 sorry, in, in, in momentum space, in K minus and K per space. This K minus conjugate to, K, to X plus, and this K per conjugate to X per, of course. And, and you see that um, I, have a, uh, the, I have the Coulomb propagator again, it should be there, but I also have a one over K minus uh, factor, which comes from the d by dx plus from here, see? But when inverting d by dx plus, I get one over k minus. And when k minus is zero, this has a pole. This is an unphysical pole, it's called an axial pole, and the prescription used here should be irrelevant. So you can use plus or minus i epsilon to build the field. You should get the same physical result at the end. The field will be dependent on the prescription because the field is not a gauge invariant quantity. But when you compute observer, it should be independent. So what's called retarded, is not really retarded advance in terms of, because X plus is not the time for the left mover, it's a right on coordinate. What is called retarded advance are defined with terms of real time, but this is not X plus would be X minus here, but there's no X minus dependence as I mentioned before, that's X plus. So the inverse of, a, of one of K minus is a theta function. Let me show you that. In, in coordinate space, this field here, it's a theta function, which means if I have a, a, a sources at, at any Y plus within some domain in Y plus, then I have a field which is constant outside that domain up to infinity. The field extends up to infinity. It's a, it's a, it's a constant field outside the nucleus. So the, the gauge field, and that's these are the partons. The gauge field extends out to the nucleus in principle up to infinity. And that's, a, uh, that's the inverse of the, of the um, Coulomb propagator with a derivative ki. So this is a derivative of the log i. See? One of k per square to be just a log, but I have a ki. ki is a derivative. The derivative of the log is x minus y divided by minus y squared. So this is what is called the Weissacker Williams film, by the way. Okay, so, so let me just give an example. I assume that the, the, because the, the color charge is localized near Y plus equals zero, this is a, it is a sheet, it's a Lorentz contracted sheet. So let me take the color charge inside the nucleus to be a delta Y plus equals zero, that's a Lycon, uh, uh, Lycon for, the, for the left mirror, the Z equal minus T or Y plus zero. So I, I take the, the, the color charge to be localized at, at Y plus zero and times uh, uh, two dimensional density in the transverse plane. Then the integration over, over is plus, y plus here is trivial because I have a delta function. And so my field is, is zero at negative x plus, is constant at positive x plus, is theta function. And uh, it depends upon x perp, they are this, uh, this um, propagator, which is uh, the derivative of the Coulomb propagator. And this is what is called the Weissacker Williams field. Quasi real or quasi, quasi, quasi real gluons or quasi real photon approximation. And this, this is the field which describes in coordinate space the, the bona fide partons in, in momentum space. It's a field which is delocalized totally in X plus, but it's a sum over modes. If you look at the modes delta X plus with a fixed K minus, then, uh, the, uh, then they're localized over distance one with K minus. The, I already used, I, I told you again and again that the gluons are delocalized uh, in the Lotion direction over a distance of order one over the inverse of the Lotion momentum. That's correct, but that is only correct in this gauge. If you look in a, in a covariant gauge, the gluons are never delocalized. They are Coulomb fields picked inside uh, at the same support as the sources. But if you look in, in, the, in, this, in this Lycon gauge, they are totally delocalized, and this property of the gluons overlapping and all that, all this physics of saturation, all that depends very much upon this delocalization, inside that the gluons overlap in space. So let me now show you the cartoons 
of that. So this is the cartoon of the of the field and the gluons in the um, in the two gauges, covariant gauge here, a Lycon gauge here. Yeah? In the covariant gauge, so that's a, that's a that's a, um, um, a cross section to the nucleus. The nucleus is a transverse plane that's longitudinal axis. It's a left move. It goes like that. It goes to a negative z. This is a transverse plane that's longitudinal axis. That's a part of a piece of the nucleus. That's one nucleon inside the nucleus. So this nucleon has a longitudinal moment to p minus. All the nucleons have this moment minus. And in the covariant gauge, this is a valence quark. The field created by the valence quark is localized in, in, in Z as localized as the field, as the, as the charge itself. So the field is, is it's a Coulomb propagator. It's instantaneous in Z. It has no, no uh, delocalization in Z. So this localization, so now this is the, the field of a single source. We have many sources which are distributed, so just add them together. So the sources, the gauge field, and the electric field strength tensor, they're all localized inside the shock. And this has a distance, a size, a width, which is the nuclear radius divided by gamma because it's lowest contractor. Now let's move to the, to the Lycon gauge. The Lycon gauge, again, the color charges are localized. And so, so is the gauge field strength tensor. But the gauge field now extends from the color charge all the way to infinity. Another one, another one. And now because they overlap, they can also interact with each other. And indeed, the Yamis equation here is nonlinear. So the non-linearity non in Yamis equation describes gluon saturation. Here, the equation was linear. These fields live at different x classes. They don't touch each other. So they cannot interact. So can, there can be no saturation. This is a picture of Coulomb fields. But these Coulomb fields can scatter all of them with this, with this quark propagating along this dotted line. That would be the multiple scattering. So I can probe high gluon fields, but only via multiple scattering. Here, on the other hand, I can also probe high gluon fields via the inter self interaction of the gluon field themselves. But only because this gluon field being delocalized up to infinity, they have the place to overlap with each other, and that's a saturation effect. So you see, the, the, the color charge and the field strength test are localized within the shock wave, but the gluon field goes all the way to infinity. This, is because this gluon field contains contribution for all the modes, inclusive, including arbitrary small k minuses, but if it's 6k minus, then the, the delocalization is 6 plus 1 over k minus, 1 over xp minus. But if you add arbitrary soft modes, you'll go to arbitrary large distances. And the, I will, I'll finish with, the, with, this cart, with, with this picture now of the field strength tensor. So before I, I was emphasizing the, sorry, I was emphasizing the structure of the gauge potential themselves. Gauge potentials are not physical observables, but the parton picture is built in terms of gauge uh, potential, not in terms of physical observables. So this is a gauge potential for the parton picture. This is a gauge potential for the Coulomb picture. So now we're looking at the field strength tensor. These are gauge independent, up to rotation. So in that case, they have well-defined physical meaning. They're always localized within the shock wave. You see, in any gauge, they're localized. They have to be localized because there's a gauge invariant. So if they're localized in one gauge, they're localized in any gauge, up to rotation. And these are, these are the, the, the field strength and potential. So I said that the only non-vanishing component is Fi minus, where I is one or two. What does it mean? If you go backwards from Lycon notation to normal notation, you realize that Fi minus non-zero means having electric and magnetic fields which are non-zero, E1, E2, and B1, B2 in the transverse plane, whereas E3 and B3 is zero. So if you look at the, at the nucleus in the, in the transverse procession, so this, these are the transverse, a piece of the trans, nucleus in the transverse procession, the collision axis is perpendicular, coming to you. These are random configuration of electric and magnetic fields. This is the electric field, this is the magnetic field, the electric field, the magnetic field. So at each point in, in, in the nucleus, I have a field strength tensor, which has a non trivial e, e, e component and non trivial B component, which are perpendicular to each other, and they're both perpendicular on the collision axis, on the direction of propagation of the nucleus. So I have mutually transverse fields, which are transverse on each other, and they're also transverse on the direction of propagation. This is exactly the same as the plane wave solution that describe, describing propagating free massless photons or gluons. But they're not really free massless waves. They're color fields created by sources. But these sources propagate themselves at the speed of light. So they create the same fields as the free massless waves. And this is called the Weisseger Williams equivalent gluons, equivalent photons in general fields. They're effectively like propagating 
free waves, and these are the partons. We speak about the partons as being the, 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 the proton is made with, with free quarks and gluons. What are the free quarks and gluons? The gluons, they not exist in the, in, the, in, the, in the proton to start with. They're produced by the quarks, but the quarks are sources, so the gluons are sourced by something. But how can we speak about free, free propagating plane waves, like free gluons, if they're produced by some sources? Well, because for the ultra-relativistic uh, system, the, 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 the linear weaker potential actually created by the ultra-relativistic sources look like free propagating plane waves. And this is what we call gluons, parton, free, free partons in the, in, the, in the parton model, or the basis of PQCD in, a, in a QCD evolution. Okay, so I, I, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you, Edmond, for the lovely lecture. So we have some questions. Could you go back to your slide of the MV model? I'd like to uh, elaborate on the uh, nice question that somebody asked as to why it should just be, no, where you had the uh, quadratic for Yeah. So this is a plausible guess, but it's QCD. It is long range interactions. There are certainly more terms possible. It's not clear to me it has to be local and x plus, and in any case, mu is a dimensional parameter. Right, if it is a... Uh, wait, 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 let, let me finish my question. Then you, mu is a dimensional parameter, it is mass. So you say it's lambda QCD, but this is 2019. Is it, you would, would hope one could derive something like this from an effective theory, which our friends on the lattice could actually measure these parameters. It's certainly been true in finite temperature field theory, where quantities such as Q hat can be derived from the lattice. Uh, well, in the sense that this mu squared is related to uh, the two point five to fi plus fi plus correlator. So, it's just, so this is this is you have. There's no difference. So let me say. There is I'm no saying difference. one should be able to derive an effective theory and then compute these parameters from a lattice without no, guessing, no, and to compute the other terms in the expansion of which there are surely other terms. The quadratic is not exact. For sure. But that will be suppressed in this. Uh, it may be suppressed at large end, but I don't care. We're three color. In any case, it's just a comment. But but, but by the way, if you, if you stay to quadratic form, then the locality in X plus is a consequence of gauge invariance. If you have, want to have something non locality in X plus, you should put a Wilson line between. And that will make it non non. I can put in one over covariant powers of one over covariant d squared. Exactly. You, you can't tell me you know it's local. No, no, I don't say it's wrong. I say it's non Gaussian anymore. Yeah, no, okay. But you don't know it's Gaussian. Oh, that was her question. That's why it was such a good question. How do you know it's Gaussian? Uh, it's the simplest guess, but it doesn't mean it is. But, the, but the, 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 it has to do with a large A limit because, you see, the, the, the two, two sources can be correlated only if they belong to the same nucleon. Otherwise, they're, they're but we're not at large n. This conference room is not at large n. I speak about large A. Large A. In any case, you understand my. If point. they come from different nucleons, they cannot be correlated, right? Because they confine different nucleons. So it, it, but nevertheless, deriving it in a form where the lattice people could actually measure something. Oh, but that's, that's trivial in way. The mu squared is related. I can define mu squared differently. That's fi plus fi plus correlator. It's, so everything you know about you had is on the, exactly on the same level as the MV model, no more. So I, I'm, I'm going to give lecture on Q hat next, next time. So Q hat is not better than that. Q hat is a fi plus fi plus correlator, mu squared and fi plus fi plus correlator. If you can compute one on that, you can compute them both. But so let me say differently. Q hat is. Uh, you're missing my point. I know. You, you must be able to derive it from a fundamental theory. No, but that's a definition of the operator. Question: What? How do you compute it? That's a different issue. Yeah. Okay. I define that as fi plus fi plus. Can we compute it? How? It's a like. It's a light like correlator. Fi plus on the like one. Aaron Huo has, for example, showed how to measure Q hat. That's very wrong. That's a, that's an effective three-dimensional theory. It has not, the, 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 the theory built in three dimension has absolutely nothing to do with QCD in four dimension. You re, so you, nobody knows how to compute Q hat on the lattice, by the way, for the same reason nobody knows how because you really need Fi plus Fi plus on the like on and not in the effective three-dimensional theory. So the, the, the results, so let me say, the EQCD, EQCD, EQCD in three dimension is, is by, temp, by a factor of 1,000% away from the physical result in four dimension. You can get a result in that theory, but that theory has nothing to do with QCD. But in that theory, yeah, you can compete in the lattice, yes. But it's a different theory. 
There's only one QC. So, uh, alternate version of the same question. Yeah. Do you have anything to say about uniqueness of the W that you have written? Under what assumption is it unique? So, by, by the way, one should not focus on that because this W is it's a, it's a model for the initial condition. Let me tell you, when you solve the Glapp equation. No, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, that's exactly why I asked this because in the initial conditions of the D Glapp, there are zillions of models. Exactly. So, do, well, let me tell you differently. All the things I'm going to discuss later is going to be, independent, be going to be universal. So, the high energy evolution couldn't tell us about the initial conditions. So all this discussion here was to, to show a simple example where I can compute things. But all the results at high energy are independent of that. So then why don't you just put it as a parameter? Why do you insist on this picture at all? That, as I said, it's an initial condition. It's exactly. supposing, supposing I said Jimbok is all, I take some arbitrary functions as so input. All the, all the, the same way that DigLab guys do, what is wrong? Yes. So there's the same. So let me say differently. The DigLab guys have no justification for the model for the initial condition, but they don't care. I, I pretend to have some physics intuition for that one, but I couldn't care less either. Because all the predictions... Have your cake and eat it too. If you pretend, then you have to tell why is it the right one. No, because what I said, this is a model. GMOC is, is a theory. So GMOC prediction at high energy are universal. They don't depend on initial condition. No, I think as long as you say that one can take any arbitrary initial condition. That's, that's, that's the case. That's fine. That's case. That's case. No, it was not initial. That, that was just a purpose. I want to compute the expectation value of Wilson lines for explicitly. And by the way, this model can be a wrong model for the nucleus, but this calculation is a very good calculation. That's the, that's the base of the, what's called the, the BDMPS Z calculation of jet quenching. So, because uh, for, a, for a weakly coupled quark gluon plasma, you can use the semi classical approximation, the ideal gas approximation. So, this is precisely the analog of the ideal gas approximation for the medium, the weakly coupled QGP on computing jet quenching. So in that case, it's much easier to just it's wicked. Yes, it's it's a like, ideal gas plus plus thereby screening. That's what it is, right? Lambda is the the thereby mass, and that's all. And, uh, I think it might be useful, but the question that was asked was how unique or why should one go for that? You might say I like it the same way somebody likes some other kinds of flavor. Uh, let me tell you why. why nothing we, more than that. In the in the small x domain, you don't need it because it's universal because you know the evolution. In the jet quenching picture, you don't know the evolution. You only know the the, the initial condition. So then you have to decide you dis, you, how to describe the plasma. And that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a weak up in picture of QGP. Now, I think the second question that I had, which is related on that W naught, is why doesn't that W naught understand that nucleus has nuclei? Nucleus have. Nu uh, nucleons in oh it does that, that's a that's a simplest version of the envy model people like burn shank and company when they use uh, envy model they use it in a much more complicated way with a with a description of nucleons with a weak saxon and each nucleon has this kind of structure yes so they do that by hand they we call the granularity of the nucleons that's that's a, that's a sim the, the simplest version of the envy model not the one which is for phenomenology So then can I do with that, right? Because he used that too. Yeah, so, so, so I'm going to follow up on this too, right? So I mean, I mean, what would be desirable, right, would be essentially to have, if possible, an operator definition for this weight function, right? I mean, Open in up. principle, when someone pulls out, I mean, this is, and correct me if I'm wrong, right? That's, I mean, that's not possible. Of all of its moments, vice versa, right? If you want, but I mean, this is, I mean, this is what in principle you need. I mean, this is in principle also what you need to, I mean, this, this, this is my real question then, right? The, to establish universality of this weight no, functional no, no, the across weight, different No, you don't have to do that. No? You don't have to, no, no, it's very simple. No, the GMOC does it. Um, so, um, intuitively... But if you want to, I mean, so say you want to know the initial conditions also, oh, right? No. So say you want to work, I mean, look, right? If I don't want to work at X 10 to the minus 6, but I want to work at X 10 to the minus 2, perhaps. Maybe point one, right? Where perhaps a lot of the kinematic approximations are actually decent, right? But I really don't know the structure of my color fields, right? Because it's somehow. Well, in, in, to lower study in PQCD, you have something like that, but then you have to. to if you stick yourself to a single scattering approximation, that's just brainstorming. See, the only non trivialities in the end model is exponentiation. The fact that you use that for multiple scattering. So if, you, if all your purpose is to compute a two point function, then any Gaussian would work. You just fit the Gaussian. The MV model is one way to fit the Gaussian. No, I'm talking beyond MV model, right? I mean, I mean, I mean the weight function should be some non-perturbatively defined object, right? Just like, just like in principle, uh, any, any, any PDF, any TMD, and so forth is. Right? 
no, what is what is well def what is defined non perturbatively are uh, uh, observables as expectation value of Wilson line. And what is constructed in PQCD is the evolution of these observables. That's all you can be defined and constructed. Everything behind that cannot be defined nor constructed. It's like, like exactly like for the graph. You can define the evolution of the PDFs, not the PDFs themselves. You can define them by models, but you cannot define them by operatorials. Not to all orders. You can define that to a given order. I, thought, I mean, I thought the PDF has a, has a But then you have, to, you have the ambiguity despite coefficients from operators. You, you, have, you, have, you, you get mixed with the evolution right away. You cannot define them in a... You can, you can define it to leading order. You can define it in a given gauge, which is a unitary gauge with the, with you, the coefficients one by construction. But it, it starts behind leading order. It's becoming it's ambiguous. Only the evolution is... Anonymous. PDFs and TMDs are things that people measure on the lattice nowadays, right? Based on quasi PDFs and so yes, forth. I mean, you, specific I mean, you have gauge invariant operator definitions in these cases. They case. don't fit the structure function. They don't compute the PDFs. City speaking, is there the same in, in specific with specific choices for normalization okay, scheme? Okay. But they're not operatory I mean, definitions. Through this channel, I mean something similar. As I said, be the, desirable. No? Uh, as I said, this mu squared is proportional to the Gluon distribution. The Gluon distribution has a definition that you may just mention, so you can use that definition. Not for the wave function, but just for the mu squared. Mm -hmm. So, if there are there any other questions, I think Edmond has had enough questions for now. So, should we just go for a tea break and resume afterwards? Mm -hmm.